Well, I'm super excited and thankful uh, to Susie for being here. I do want to introduce you. Um, Susie Kim is a serial founder, product strategist, and experienced designer. She built a small coffee roastery and ceramic studio as a junior in college at UCLA um, and grew it into a four branch franchise within a year and generating over $1 million in revenue. As a senior at UCLA, she went on to found her first consumer fintech startup, Pluto Money. And while working on Pluto, it became her personal mission to support Gen Z's efforts towards social impact. And today, what led her to today uh, as the founder and chief product and ops at Electric Potential, a nonprofit foundation with an aim to catalyze Gen Z high school and college students to become agents of social change. So with that, Susie, thank you again for being here and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Rachel. So let's get started. So yes, today I'm going to talk about my nonprofit foundation called Electric Potential. We are a Gen Z Power Social Change brand. Um, so a little bit about us. We are a Gen Z digital community and information hub for creating social change. Electric Potential is the first guided resources program built to catalyze Gen Z to become agents of social change who will, um, sorry, my screen is kind of blocked off here, but who will educate the public implement effective policy and or fund programs that foster impact. So we're really targeting high school and college students that are interested in social impact and giving them all of the resources, all of the support to get started on their social impact journey and really grow as a long term into agents of social change as either advocacy leaders, policy makers or policy funders. So why are we doing that? Um, we talked to about 500 high school, college students who are current Gen Zs. And what we learned is that most Gen Z students describe today's world as hopeless and in despair and feeling lost. Um, and Gen Z have just grown up bombarded with a lot of news on social media about the news that are happening today and the events that are happening around the world. It's mass shooting yesterday, wars and genocides today, and another climate crisis tomorrow. So there's a lot happening. But rather than give to pessimism, this amazing generation of students have kind of risen to power and chose to do something about that future, chose to build a future that they actually want to live in with their own hands. So while there's a lot of motivation for change, it's really difficult to get into actual actions and start making changes, right? So um, based on that survey that we did, 96% of students told us that they want to take more action, but just feel too lost and overwhelmed on where to get started, where to get the correct information that are unbiased and what kind of actions actually are meaningful. 80% told us that they have been working on some sort of activism, whether it's donating to causes, going out to marches and rallies, or supporting different organizations by sharing social media posts or even more volunteering. But they still feel isolated, defeated, and just not impactful enough in their efforts. And that happens because there's no visual progress that you can see that are happening collectively um, as a result of your action. And then 100% of the students told us that they are worried about echo chambers, false information or bias in social media. So that's why we are building electric potential. We believe in our generation's massive electric potential, um, hence the name. And we want to create sustainable awareness around social issues. And by sustainable awareness, what we're meaning is that it's not just knowing about a thing that's happening out in the world. It's not about infinite scrolling on Instagram and knowing, oh, right, there's that court case that's happening. Oh, right, there's that war that's happening. And just kind of like having a simple awareness. It's more about digging in, doing your own research and making sure that the facts and information that you have in your mind about this social issue is actually unbiased not furthering echo chambers, not furthering any polarization. And that means you do have to do further research by going to government websites, by going to news sources and kind of like build a muscle around 
finding out what information is biased, what language is biased, and that practice takes a long time and that's a really hard process, which is what we're trying to make easier. Um, so our brand, we just stand with Gen Z as a generation. We have a lot of belief in our student generation and we want to see a lot of positively charged future happening through our generation's hands. Um, so our vision is an equitable, sustainable and positively charged world led by our generation. And our mission is to catalyze Gen Z to become agents of social change. And for those of you who aren't familiar with vision versus mission statements, and I had a lot of trouble like um, figuring out like what's what and like how to define or differentiate the either of them. And what I've learned so far, and this is kind of my personal journey and like I'm still learning too, is that vision is the outcome, like the farther future that you see happening as the outcome of your work. It's maybe sometimes unattainable. It's not something that you can directly result, but by doing work um, at your organization or through your project, you are hoping that as an end result, the world will look like this. Whereas our mission is something that's a little more attainable. Mission is kind of like a strategy on how you can achieve your vision. Um, so um, in order to achieve this equitable, sustainable and positively charged world, we are catalyzing Gen Zers to become agents of social change. So that's kind of how we break down our vision and mission. Um, and how are we doing that? Um, we have a three steps of impact making, which starts with building that sustainable awareness on social issues. And once you have social um, awareness, sustainable awareness on issues, then you start taking actions one step at a time. It can start really small. Um, and we try to make it easy for you to decide what actions are meaningful to you and related to the causes you care about through um, taking a simple quiz on our website. And then you can stay inspired, motivated, and represented through um, a couple of our features. Like we have a community that's getting built right now. And we have what's called Gen Z Spotlights, where we interview a lot of Gen Zers and share their story, their projects, and what they're working on. So that's kind of our way, uh, three steps of impact making that we follow. So some of the features that we have in terms of building social um, issue awareness is this massive list of social issues that we have. Our team kind of like sat down together and thought about what are all of the issues that we can think of in the world and we came up with a list of 27 of these. And then we categorized them into, all right, which ones are individual issues like adulting, how to become an adult or like digital health, emotional health, financial health, mental health, all of the things that aren't talked about enough. And then there are societal issues like economic inequality, LGBTQIA, gender issues. Then there are environmental issues like animal rights and sustainability. Then there are political issues. Like there are so many political issues from healthcare to immigration, to wars and genocide, to gun control, to uh, policing and prison reform, all of that. And we think they're all intricately interconnected with each other. Um, all of these issues are intersectional. Um, so what happens is, if you are interested in one of these issues and you want to learn more, let's say um, policing and policing brutality, um, then you can tap on that link and go to our issues page and learn all about the historical context, government actions that have been taken, what the liberalists are saying about this issue versus what the conservatives are saying about it. So we don't try to kind of like sway your opinion in any direction. We are an unbiased party giving you information so that you can have all of the facts in front of you and you can start building your opinion. Um, we try to visualize a lot of this because this is a really, really dense topic and there's a lot of information that happens. So one thing we do is um, showing a timeline of information. Um, and for each of these timeline items, you can kind of like tap into it and read more about what has happened. And there are a lot of like data visualization on like, okay, how do we understand policing and police brutality? Um, so this is like an example of data visualization that our team built to 
get that information across in a way that makes a little more sense to you than like reading a huge block of text. Um, then we have another feature called Gen Z Spotlights that I just talked about where we feature other Gen Z change makers or Gen Z led nonprofit organizations, digital communities, grassroots movements, consumer brands, social ventures, um, et cetera. And we, our goal is just to like keep sharing information and stories so that we can break down the barriers. It's, it's our goal with the spotlights isn't to keep the spotlight on who already has the spotlight, but based on a lot of Gen Zers, high school, college students that have told us, hey, I just kind of feel like I am not good enough to make change because at the end of the day, I'm just a high school student. I'm 18, what do I know? I should be in school. And why do they have this mindset? It's because of our society, our adults continuously telling our students, you're 18, you should be in school, you can't make a change. What do you know? You should be um, thinking about fin finishing school and getting a job, then you can start thinking about social change. But that's not really true, right? Like we already have 16, 18 year olds out in the world doing amazing things, creating massive impacts. And they didn't start out by being like a huge influencer. They started out day one being passionate about a social issue and then doing their research and getting their actions started. It started out with one follower that were listening to their story and then five and then 10 and then now maybe thousands, right? So you always have to start somewhere and our way of sharing these like community stories of who is our classmates or my doormate or next door neighbor or my childhood friend that is passionate about social impact and just getting started, maybe one or two steps ahead of me on getting their journey started. Um, so we share these stories and how to get involved with them. Um, so this is kind of like the spotlights that we have. Um, so if you are interested in what we are working on, there are several ways to be involved. Um, so one way uh, is to come to our website at electropotential.org. It's like a simple beta sign up website. So you're not going to see all of these features that I just kind of showed you the tidbits of. But if you fill out the form at electricpotential.org and sign up to become a beta tester, then we can send you an invite to join our actual invite. Um, actual website. Um, and we are also starting out with our small community and plan to kind of like do a full scale community towards early next year. So you have a chance to join early and become becoming a community founding member. So if you're interested in doing that, you can come to this website and fill out a simple form and we will send you an invite. Um, there is a limit. We are only sending invites to up to 300 students. So you might want to get there fast. We're already filled up at about 200 something. Um, or you can join our team. So um, over the summer, I did another event with Startup UCLA for the Summer Institute where the high school students uh, learned about social impact and how to become a social founder. And we actually found three amazing interns um, that reached out to me through the program. And now they are our UI interaction designer, our financial strategist, and our community strategist. And we have a few more positions that are open. Um, so whether you're interested in doing um, or like learning how to become a product manager or if passionate about content creating, um, writing the Gen Z Spotlight interviews, or if you're interested in like going deep into the government works and how to learn about policy, you can become our policy program researcher, community manager, or work on partnerships and outreach. So um, feel free to email me at suzy at electricpotential.org um, and just tell me, hey, um, I listened to your talk on Startup UCLA and I'm interested in, in learning more about these positions or potentially joining the team as an apprentice or an intern. Um, so let me know. And that's us. Um, we are Electric Potential, and you can also follow us on Instagram at electric, electric Potential, Electric Dot Potential. We're super early, but um, you're going to see a lot of our product updates and um, team updates from there. So please make sure to do that. And I'll open it up back to Rachel for any questions.
Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Susie. It's so exciting to hear um, how much you've grown since you've launched. With a few minutes, um, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or, um, or uh, raise your physical or digital hand. Um, and, and Andrea also had asked um, for, for one of the slides. Susie, would you be willing to share those with me and then I'll share them out to... Um, yeah, that way they folks, if they want to learn more about electric potential or kind of your thinking through, um, they can have those, which would be great. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, I have a couple questions for you. So I would love to hear, um, I love how you start really, really talking about why you're doing this and the research that you've done with students. But as far as what um, getting started, like what were some of the first, uh, Bruin Impact Challenge is really about coming with ideas and kind of those initial first steps to launching something with social impact. So I'd love to hear um, how you got started and what are some of what are some of the first steps that you took and what other, uh, let's just start there. What are some of the first steps that you took? That's a really good question and a big one to answer too. Um, as someone who has been working on product side of things for the past six, seven years now, I have a framework around product strategies that I follow. And I am pretty like relentless about this, um, especially during the beginning phase of starting anything. Um, what I learned over the process is that when you're in the beginning phase, you just want to like go all out with your ideas. You have so many ideas. You are thinking about what your name's gonna be, what your logo is gonna look like, who your first customer, first user is going to look like. And it's really exciting. And it's kind of super easy because of that to get distracted by from your core mission, which is figuring out what the problem statement is, what kind of problems actually exist out in the world that you are actually going to solve. And you have to validate, validate, validate this. And the way that I do it is I come up with anywhere between three to five cohorts of different users. And I know a lot of students are familiar with a concept of user personas, but I personally don't like the concept of user persona. And I follow another framework called jobs to be done. And if anyone wants to learn more about it, it's really easy to just Google jobs to be done. And there's like a whole website on like how to use jobs to be done. But essentially it's that when you're building a user persona, you focus so much on who that person is, whether her name is Hannah and she goes to UCLA and she's a sophomore and she's majoring in what, and she has red hair and like all of these different details that you forget to ask what her problem is when it comes to this um, area of issue that I'm trying to focus and um, figure out. So jobs to be done kind of moves away from all of the details on who and focuses on what. What are they trying to solve? What is something they're having trouble with? And what are their current solutions? And what do they wish existed in the world instead? And then once you have that, you can finally start to see, okay, so these are potential assumptions on problem statements and how they're solving it and what's still missing. And there's like a gap in the market and that's where I'm going to come in and that's my differentiation. So I build those like three to five different user cohorts based on different problem statements on this topic. So when it comes to social change, what I started with was the journey of social change. So we could have started by um, started out by tackling people who don't care about social impact at all. They don't think it's their problem. They don't want to get involved. We could have targeted like their uh, kind of like cohort and kind of work done. Okay, like how do we get you to start caring? How do you get you to become a social impact maker as like a day one person? Or we could have gone like all the way out to the current impact influencers of the world, people who already have their communities, their following base, and their problem may have been, okay, we're doing a lot of work and we're um, organizing all these rallies and we're getting all these petitions. But at the end of the day, we feel like nothing is really changing in, in our society. Then our potential solution could have been, okay, seems like there's a lot of scattered and segmented um, 
actions that are happening, how do we bring them together and create some sort of policy change from here? That could have been our solution. Um, instead, what we started focusing on is um, our middle group, cohort three, um, what we call impact makers. These are people who are aware of everything that's happening in the world and want to do more, but don't know where to get started. So it's a really specific cohort based on that problem statement. The problem statement is, I don't know where to get started, but I want to do more. Where, like, where do I go? What do I do? Tell me, right? So that's exactly what we're building. So once I have those different cohorts, I go back and interview minimum of five people per each cohort to validate those assumptions on, okay, this is my assumption on problem and how they might be currently solving it and what kind of product they might be looking for. Is that actually true or not? But that user interviews, like you have to be really careful not to be, not to be asked leading questions. Like you already have an idea in your mind and you just want to validate that, yes, people will like this by asking things like, if, um, there was a product like this existed, would you use it or not? That's a leading question, but you have to like really build a muscle on how to ask open-ended questions, how to ask the questions of five whys um, and get really deep um, and dig into their problem statement and where that problem statement arises from. Um, so once you have done this interview process, then it'll probably become close, um, pretty clear to you within that process on oh, like based on how the interview went, I think my target segment, my go-to market is going to be this one user cohort. Um, and that's still an assumption because you only talk to five people. Now is the time to do a wider validation by doing a survey. So that's why we did a survey with up to 500 people um, validating whether these, this person that's answering the survey belongs in this cohort. And then if they are, do they actually agree with these problem statements in an open-ended question and how they're currently solving it? Um, so it's a, it's a whole process, but, and it takes a long time to do that too. But if you get through that, you're not only going to have a really clear understanding of who your target market is, what their problem statement is, how they're currently solving it, what's currently missing and whether that matches what you're trying to build or not. And like, if it doesn't, how do you kind of pivot your idea into what's going to actually solve things? Um, so if anyone asks you, whether it's your potential user or a potential investor um, that asks you, how do you know if this is a problem? How did you validate it? You have a really concrete answer of this whole process that you did um, that's backed by not only qualitative data, but also quantitative from survey. Um, and what's really cool thing, um, cool about this process is that as you're doing those like cohort setups and doing interviews, you probably won't have like one very clear target market to go with. You'll probably have like maybe two, maybe three, like I don't really know. Then stick with one that's the lowest hanging fruit, like what which one is the group that's actively seeking product like yours? And who has the biggest problem statement that's really getting in the way of their day-to-day? -day? Go with them. And then the other cohorts that you were like maybe about, they kind of become naturally your product roadmap to tackle after you have kind of like penetrated this initial market. So now you have a long-term product and user roadmap to expand it to as well. So it's kind of like a foundation work. And I like to say that like, if you don't spend enough time building this like foundation concretely, then it's going to become a problem in the future. So it's better to spend time to like really understand all of these basic things before you get into any of the product building. Um, so yeah, the biggest thing here is like, don't just like jump into building a product. Don't jump into thinking that you need money so you can hire a developer. Really understand the problem statement, how you're going to solve it, have that validated. And then you'll have a concrete idea of what you need to build and what the MLP, the MVP version of that product is. And you can just go from there. And honestly, it will be a faster process in the long run um, if you get all of these questions answered. That was a really long answer to your simple question. No, that's fantastic. It actually is um, really well aligned with what we talked about last week. So anyone who came last week or watched last week's um, replay 
uh, we talked a lot about like, but briefly, uh, I mean, the, the, the whole goal was validation, this validation plan, how do you validate your ideas? And specifically, how do you really focus in on that problem first? Um, so what you're saying aligns perfectly with what we learned last week. Um, and it's a great That's example. because I learned everything I know from starting UCLA when I got started. <laughs> um, perfect. And it's actually, it's nice to hear with an example um, like yours because uh, it helps us kind of visualize what, what we're talking about when we talk about validation. And I think specifically how you've set it up in these cohort models where you're kind of like whittling down who those people are um, is a really good method and a really uh, interesting one that people can take a lot of, um, a lot of learnings from. Um, so even though that was a long answer um, and we are up on the seven o'clock hour or the four o'clock hour, excuse me, I'm ahead on East Coast time, uh, the four o'clock hour, um, I think it's really helpful to hear um, even more about um, about validation and how critical it is um, before you do anything, before you build anything, before you spend a ton of money on developers or you know learn how to code, um, really finding that problem and validating it. So um, thank you so much, Susie, for that and for the presentation and for all your, the work you're doing at uh, at Electric Potential. It's really exciting to see it. Um, and with that, uh, unless there are any other questions for Susie, we will go ahead and shift on over to talk theory of change. All right, Susie, thank you so much again. We appreciate you being here and taking the time to share thank all you your so knowledge much for having us. me. So here's a quick view for today. Uh, it'll be short and sweet. Uh, we're going to start off with some lessons from a very famous social entrepreneur that I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, then I'll introduce you to the, my preferred um, tool for impact measuring called the theory of change. Um, and after that, uh, you'll have time to ask any questions uh, pertaining to either theory of change itself or to the Bruin Impact Challenge. So anybody recognize this guy? Know who this is? Yes, no, maybe. Slide this over here. Well, most people say, yes, did I see a thumbs up? Thank you. Um, his name is not, in fact, Tom, but Blake Mikowski, the founder of Tom's Shoes, um, who was instrumental in bringing, really bringing social entrepreneurship into the mainstream and pioneering the one for one model that took the world by storm back in 2006, uh, where ev for every pair of shoes sold, a pair would be donated to a child in need. So real quick, the story goes something like this. Uh, back in 2006, Blake was on vacation in Argentina and he met a woman who was volunteering to deliver shoes to children who didn't have any. He offered to help and the experience really birthed his idea for Tom's. Only a few months later, uh, the shoes were for sale in the US. The story caught fire and over 10,000 uh, pairs of shoes were sold in that first year. Um, and by October of that year, the first batch uh, of 10,000 free shoes were donated to kids in Argentina. By 2011, Tom's could be found in 500 retailers across the globe. And by 2012, they donated over 2 million pairs of new shoes to children in developing countries. So it sounds pretty good, right? Uh, but unfortunately, around the same time, the international development community started to question the Tom's model. Um, they were asking, you know, if maybe consumers were feeling good, but there was they were not actually addressing uh, the underlying causes of poverty, which was Tom's stated mission at the time was to alleviate poverty. And at closer examination, um, people and experts alike really started to wonder if the company was actually perhaps causing harm to the local economies of nations where shoes were being given away. Um, and really criticism started popping up uh, all over the place. And to their credit, Tom's attempted to address some of these concerns, but really often uh, fell short of, of addressing them. And in 2018, a comprehensive study was published on the impact of Tom's shoes program in El Salvador, um, which really confirmed what the critics had been thinking that Tom's, uh, the Tom's model had harmful effects and caused an economic decline in local production and employment where the shoes were being donated. Um, the study also found that in-kind donations contributed uh, to negative impacts on the psychology of recipients, um, unintentionally, of course, fostering a sense of dependency on outside donors. So, not only was Tom's 
Oops, not yet. Not only was Tom's program not accomplishing their mission of alleviating poverty, uh, but they were actually causing economic, social, and psychological harm to the communities they were trying to support. And it inevitably uh, caused the business to struggle and the company ended up changing hands and charting a new course from both a business and an impact perspective. Um, in 2019, there's that one, Tom's giving, uh, chief, giving, chief Giving Officer uh, announced that the company would no longer, they stopped doing one for one. Um, they stopped that business model they had uh, made so famous and instead started giving impact grants. And so today they give a third of their profits to grassroots organizations. Um, so they are on what looks like a better path now, but it took a lot of time and energy and resources to get here. And they caused harm along the way um, that a lot of people believe, I believe, could have been avoided or at least understood much earlier in their journey. Um, and this is not to say that Tom's or Blake uh, is bad. I don't believe they did any of this intentionally or maliciously. Actually, I think they had really, really good intentions. Um, but it's a great case study uh, to help us remember that even the best of intentions on their own do not always equal positive impact, right? There are lots of other stories like this, especially when it comes to international aid um, of, of good intentions not equaling positive impact or oftentimes causing, causing harm. Um, any thoughts? on what Blake or Tom's could have done differently or what we uh, folks who are looking to drive positive change uh, with our ideas can do to avoid harm on our mission. You can unmute or just type in the chat. Yeah, I have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned that that um, they probably could have caught it earlier. And I know we've talked a little bit about theory of change while I work on my paper. So so I, I certainly understand thanks to that framework, like how you can kind of catch, you know, through outputs and thinking about even your feasibility testing, right, through validation and all of that. Um, in your opinion, just having seen so many projects, like when do you think they they should have been able to catch it? And what did they kind of, fail to do that probably could have helped them prevent this early on? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Deb. Um, sure. So a couple of things. I think first and foremost, it comes to what we were talking about last week and even what Susie was sharing, which is really getting to know the people you're trying to support and to serve. So like a lot of social enterprises, Tom's has two customer bases, right? He has the people, the consumers who are buying the shoes, but he also, and I'm sure they did a lot of market research around those people. Yeah. Um, and we, we oftentimes do a lot of market research around kind of the consumer base, but he also should have done some research around the communities he was hoping to serve and support instead of just assuming that what they needed to alleviate poverty was shoes or shoes delivered delivered in this method. So that would have been part of his solution uh, validation plan or even part of his problem validation plan, where mm -hmm. if he would have gone in and, and investigated a little further, done a little bit more research, even some of the sociological research of just observing, um, they could have thought, thought through some of those supply chain issues. Um, one of the big pieces of criticism of disrupting local economies was that if you bring in shoes to donate, what happens to the folks who are doing all of the supply chain locally to make shoes? So mm -hmm. not just the people who are making shoes locally, but the person, people who are selling them, the people who are producing the fabrics, the people who are producing um, the other, you know, the tools that, that help make them. So all of these pieces that really are part of the local economy were disrupted. Um, and obviously they didn't do that research. Or I don't think they did that research um, up front or that validation because when they finally discovered that several years later they they shifted course right so mm -hmm. i i imagine that they didn't do that kind of work so so that problem validation that that solution validation with in the communities you're hoping to support is really really key um and another thing i think they could have done is something like the theory of change which thinks through these things and we've actually talked about this um the last time we talked is something you mentioned is um, thinking about potential harm that could be caused. Um, and yeah. even though that's not officially part of the theory of change framework, it's something that completing a theory of change helps you to do. And something I think any social entrepreneur, whether you're building a product or a service, or if you're doing a one-off event or, um, or a social impact focused um, 
art piece or you know production, um, really any social you know strategic giving strategy, any of the tracks that we're talking about really in the Bruin Impact Challenge um, could leverage the theory of change to think through what are the potential impacts that we're going to have and is this impact positive or negative and where could it be negative? Um, yeah. Because when we talk about social impact, that doesn't, it doesn't automatically mean positive social impact. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That's is, there a way to, is there a way to test these things? Because, um, and I'm thinking just from the Tom's model, which would obviously apply to everybody just to like test an idea to make sure that you aren't causing more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a way to kind of test it without actually putting people at risk? Because I think right now what I've written, and I know that I'm going back to solution validation more than theory of change with this, but I'm genuinely asking because I don't want to hurt people at the end of the day. Um, right. Like, is there, what I've written is I'm like, technically, I guess we could randomize variables just using like statistical software to see what all the possible outcomes would be with um, market factors and and um, different um, market fluctuations and volatility, right? But I mean, cause that's not, I mean, I'm not trying to go into the housing market and like actually destroy lives, right? Like it's much better obviously to do this in a simulated model. What are, what are ways that people can simulate it or try to understand like what all could go wrong? Because even with the Tom's model, the last thing you wanna do is go into a developing country and make things even more volatile with their markets as well. So what, are, what is something that like we can all do to kind of protect the community that we actually want to help? Yeah, I think a big part of that, thank you for that question. I think a big part of that goes back to continuing those relationships throughout the duration of your venture or of whatever it is you're doing. Um, I think a lot of times we think of, um, because a big part of it is validation, right? If they had gone back and talked to some of these, um, talked, had been more in relationship with the local communities, would they have found out this out ahead of time? Perhaps, but maybe not. But would they have found it out pretty quickly? Um, you know, within the first year, perhaps, if they had kept a pulse um, and an open relationship and open communication with those individuals or communities in those um, in those places, perhaps. So what I would say for you is, you want to do all and I'll say is the research up front as well so even before you do any validation with people there's tons of research that already exists about in your case housing um, how yeah. different housing projects have failed in the past or succeeded in the past using leveraging that information that already exists um, which is the same thing Tom you know they could have done um, in their case because the reason the international development community started making rumblings way before Tom's did anything about it was because they knew, they'd seen it, they already had that data, right? So looking at current, you know, the data that exists, doing your validation, and then keeping in close contact and close community, really measuring, and this is a great segue, so thank you for this, really measuring um, your impact as you move through and as you grow um, is really the best way to, to help you reduce the harm that is potential that could could be caused along the way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And that is a good a good segue um, because the idea what we're talking about today of of planning your change and and measuring your impact um, is really how we make sure we are in fact creating positive impact we intend and not just having those assumptions, right? So it's all about planning and and measuring throughout, staying in close community with people we're hoping to support and our customers. So that is the, the topic of this workshop, which is theory of change. Again, one of my favorite tools um, that is widely used in the social impact space. So the theory of change framework really just documents um, the change that your idea is seeking to achieve and helps you think critically about your plan to make that change happen. Um, it also brings awareness of potential challenges, just like we just talked about, um, that could arise or unintended consequences that could cause harm along the way for any stakeholders. And the key there is any stakeholders, not just your customers, but anyone in the community, anyone in uh, along the supply chain, right? Anyone who touches or comes into contact um, or is impacted by your, um, your project, your idea, your business, or your um, whatever it is that you're building. So there are some great templates 
uh, for mapping your theory of change, but this is the one that I rec recommend using. It just helps you visualize uh, your theory of change. Either way, no matter what you use, um, you'll notice there are five components, um, in inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impact. Um, and I'm going to use an example as we walk through this quickly. Um, I see there are some questions or some chat. I'm just gonna stop real quick. Uh, Justin says, studies have shown food aid from foreign sources have shown the same negative results mm -hmm, on local food production. Um, they could have taught people how to make shoes and clothing so they didn't, yeah. so they had skills rather than mere handouts. Um, interviewing local stakeholders and nonprofits would likely have revealed the unintended consequences. Yes, apologies, Justin, that I just saw the little um, notification on the chat, but absolutely, um, yes training instead of giving or supporting lo the local economy in some other way, even through just grants. We, we oftentimes want it to look a certain way or feel a certain way that we think is correct. Um, but if you talk to the people who you're wanting to support, they know, they know about themselves and their communities. Um, absolutely. Thank you for, thank you for that. And there, is, there are like, like uh, Justin just mentioned, a lot of studies that have shown this. Um, so even just doing that quick research, right, could help, could help us. Um, okay, um, and I will try to be more conscious of looking at the chat. Um, so in the last workshop, uh, I mentioned an organization that I worked with up in Santa Barbara who was providing fresh produce to under-resourced community members, um, and they could have benefited from doing a theory of change. So I'm going to use them as my example as we walk through the framework. So if you'll remember, um, they were an organization growing fresh produce um, and, and help and giving that um, speaking of, of food organizations, giving that uh, produce to um, food banks who are then distributing it um, to, to the local community. So I recommend you start at the end with the impact you hope to have and reverse engineer your way back and how to get there and where to start. So start with impact, which is the systemic change, the kind of the big picture change you wish to see over the long term. Think of it as Again, the big picture um, that, that if you accomplish your goals, um, kind of like what Susie mentioned about vision, um, this is kind of that vision piece where it's maybe not super attainable right away or it might take you know decades or years. It's really this big systemic change that you wanna contribute to. And when we fill this out, we ask ourselves, what impact are we hoping to see over the, over the long term? Um, or what change will take place if our venture is successful? So, as our example, if we are working for the organization doing the Tower Garden Project and creating their theory of change, we would think about what long-term long impact they're hoping to have on their community. Um, and we always want to include both a qualitative and quantitative measure. So they believed their solution re would result in people living longer and having a better quality of life. So under impact, we would write that people will live three to five years longer and have a better quality of life. Make sense? Cool. All right. Next, we look at our outcomes, which are the intended and unintended changes uh, that your stakeholders are experiencing or might experience because of your work. In other words, outcomes are the broader benefits uh, your work, you're working to achieve. So we ask, what will change? This is kind of like your midterm goal. What will change in the midterm and how can we track it? So as an example, our farmers might say, we want to see a 10% increase in the number of people who are eating fresh produce uh, two to three times a week. And we'll track it through community gatherings once per quarter. And we'll talk to the community members or do listening sessions and survey, um, something like that. Again, how do we make sure we're keeping a pulse um, and, and always in, in conversation with, with the people we're hoping to serve? Next is outputs. Outputs are the immediate results of your product or service or program. Uh, these are the positive indicators that your outcomes are on track. So we ask, how will it change in the short term? How will things change in the short term? And, and again, how can we track it? We always wanna be tracking, that's the measurement part, right? So for our example organization, this could be a hundred community members. And this is oftentimes where you see those really, um, those output numbers that you hear most of the time in, in impact conversations or in, in impact reports. So this could be 100 uh, community members receive fresh produce each month and 75 people are taking a cooking class. Remember we said one of their programs needs to be offering education around um, the produce. 
uh, and we can measure this through signups or registrations for both things. Um, and remember to always keep in mind that these can start off as estimates and then you can gather more data and you'll get a clearer picture of your baseline and where you want to go over time. So next are activities. We're talking specifically about what activities must take place for your output to occur. So we ask, what activities are we doing to bring about this change? As in what activities must take place in order for the output of 100 people receiving fresh uh, produce every month? What do we need to do to make that happen? So back to our example, um, that might be the weekly harvest. They have to, they have to gather all the produce um, and then they have to deliver it to the food bank. Um, they have to design and facilitate the cooking classes, right? So, so that the community is educated in how to use, to use these different kinds of produce so that they will do it, um, right? And that's part of their um, having that, that goal of 75 people take a class is having uh, making sure those classes exist, right? That's an activity that you have to do in order to get that output over here of uh, people taking those classes. And lastly is inputs, uh, which are the resources needed to ensure the activities take place. So we ask what, uh, what do we invest in the project or what resources are needed to ensure um, those activities are taking place? So for our example, our uh, nonprofit, they would need that tower technology that grows the produce. They would need skilled farmers or some skilled uh, folks to make sure that it was being grown and harvested correctly. They would need space to host their cooking classes, a chef or a nutritionist, someone who's really following along in the impact and making sure that that long-term change way over, um, over on the end is happening and people really are becoming healthier. So that is our theory of change for our example organization, the garden, uh, the tower garden project. But you can apply this idea um, really to, so this is a social venture. That's again, where, where we often focus at Startup UCLA, of course, but kind of making it broader, you really can apply whether it's a venture you're working on or an organization, but this also can be applied to individual initiatives or programs or one-off art exhibitions or volunteer events. Um, really any, any idea that could be eligible for the Bruin Impact Challenge um, could benefit through thinking through a theory of change and really help uh, ensure that your good intentions are creating positive impact, which is the whole point 